Education is important, but for one man, teaching was deadly. Gary Hoy was a lawyer in Toronto. On July 9, 1993, he was on the 24th floor of his office building and he was trying to prove to his students that the glass windows were unbreakable. Gary had done this before. He would get a running start and hit one of the windows as hard as he could. Nothing bad ever happened, but this time, events didn't unfold as expected. Gary hit one of the windows and bounced off. Then he decided to try it again. When he hit the window a second time, the glass popped out. Gary flew out the window and met his end after hitting the ground. A structural engineer later pointed out that the glass did not break. It simply popped out of its frame. Gary worked for the largest law firm in Canada. Thanks in part to this mishap, it closed in 1996. Most people know that hurricanes are a problem in Florida, but sometimes the earth can swallow people too. Beneath Florida, the ground is filled with limestone caverns. Water dissolves them and sometimes the ground above collapses. On March 1, 2013, Jeffrey Bush was in his bedroom in Sefner watching television. Suddenly there was a loud noise and he screamed. Jeffrey's family rushed in and found that he was gone. There was a sinkhole. Jeffrey and everything in the bedroom was gone. The only thing left was a cable extended from the wall into the depths below. Heavy equipment was brought in to try to retrieve Jeffrey, but he was never found. Unfortunately, sinkholes are not unusual in this part of the state. The county where Jeffrey lived has had 500 of them since 1954. Normally, royalty is treated better than the rest of us, but during World War II, the United States let a prince die. Prince Valdemar was born in Kiel, Germany on March 20th, 1889. His great-grandmother was Queen Victoria, and like several other people in the family, he had a serious illness. The prince was a hemophiliac. The slightest injury could cause him to bleed to death. The condition was treated by giving the prince frequent blood transfusions. However, when the Russian army began advancing on his home, he had to flee. He arrived in Bavaria, and it looked as if German doctors would save him with another blood transfusion. But on May 1st, 1945, the United States Army appeared and occupied the area. The Army stopped Prince Valdemar's doctor from giving him a transfusion. All medical supplies were redirected to help the concentration camp survivors. The Prince passed away the next day. Sometimes women get really angry at their husbands. In one town, they decided murder was the answer. During World War I, men in a village near Budapest began dying at an unusual rate. Their wives were the reason why. The village didn't have any doctors. The only person who knew anything about health care was the local midwife, Mrs. Fizikas. When wives in the town complained about their husbands, the midwife offered a solution. Arsenic would kill an abusive husband easily. Over the next few years, the local graveyard started filling up. In 1929, investigators decided to examine the dead husbands. Out of the 50 bodies that were checked, 46 of them contained arsenic. When the police showed up to arrest Mrs. Fazekas, she consumed her own arsenic and passed away. Over the next several years, 26 women were put on trial for murder. None of them ever explained why they committed murder. The final death toll may have been as high as 300. Service animals have been around for a long time, and one of them used to work for the railroad. In 1880, James Jumper Wide was a railway signaler near Port Elizabeth, South Africa. He received the nickname Jumper because he liked to jump between rail cars. But one day he fell and both of his legs were removed by the train. Rather than quit his job, in 1881 James bought a baboon named Jack. He taught Jack to push his wheelchair around and operate the railway signals. After a passenger reported that a baboon was changing the signals, the railroad company began an investigation. Rather than remove Jack, he was hired as a new employee. He was paid 20 cents a day and was given a bottle of beer each week. During his nine years of employment, Jack never made a single mistake. Unfortunately, Jack caught tuberculosis and died in 1890. One woman in India proved that age isn't an obstacle to being a mother. Aramati Mangama was born in India on September 1, 1946. She married in 1962, but she and her husband were never able to have children. After menopause, it appeared that the time for babies had passed. But in 2018, she heard about in vitro fertilization. Aramati visited a doctor, received her treatment, and finally became pregnant. 
At the age of 73, she gave birth to twins in a nursing home. Aramati also became the oldest woman to ever carry a pregnancy to term. Unfortunately, her children will grow up without a father. He died in October 2020, a year after the twins were born. People in love do all sorts of strange things. In one case, a couple lost their heads. In April 2023, a couple in New Delhi, India decided that they didn't want to continue living with each other, and they didn't want to live without each other either. So the pair developed a ritual that would end their earthly existence. A fire was prepared at a nearby altar, then a device was constructed which functioned like a guillotine. When the couple was ready, they placed their heads beneath the blade. The husband then let go of the rope he was holding. The iron blade fell and severed both of their heads. After the heads were removed, they fell into the fire. The final part of the ritual was then complete. Nobody is sure why they chose this exact method, but fire is sacred to members of the Hindu faith. Sometimes advertising campaigns can kill. In 1986, an advertising agency created a new character to help Domino's Pizza increase sales. It was called The Noid. The character appeared in a video game called Avoid the Noid, and it was even going to be part of a cartoon. The Noid also drove one man to murder. Kenneth Lamar Noid was mentally ill and thought the advertising campaign was directed at him specifically. On January 30th, 1989, he walked into a Domino's Pizza location in Chambly, Georgia and held the employees hostage at gunpoint. The hostages escaped and Kenneth was arrested. He was taken to a mental institution where he took his own life in 1995. Domino's Pizza quit using the Noid in advertisements for several years after Kenneth's rampage, but the character began appearing in commercials once again in 2021. One woman invented a device we use every day, and she never got paid for it. Mary Anderson was born in Alabama in 1866. In 1902, she went to New York City. As she sat in a trolley on a rainy day, Mary noticed the driver had problems seeing through the wet windshield. Mary had an idea. She created the first windshield wiper. A hand crank inside the vehicle allowed the driver to operate the blade. Mary received a patent for her device in 1903. Unfortunately, cars weren't very popular yet. Most manufacturers thought that her idea was worthless and they didn't want to pay for it. Mary's patent expired in 1920. Then in 1922, Cadillac became the first manufacturer to put windshield wipers in their vehicles as a standard feature. Mary was never paid for her creation. Mary Anderson passed away in Tennessee in 1953. She was 87 years old. The Central Intelligence Agency has a long history of strange ideas. After World War II ended, the United States occupied the Philippines. Communist rebels didn't want Americans there, so they began fighting back. Edward Lansdale was a marketing executive before the war. In the army, he became an expert in psychological warfare. In 1950, the CIA wanted his help dealing with the Philippine rebels. Edward spent time researching the locals. He found that they believed in a mythical creature called the Aswang. To Edward, the superstitious beast behaved much like a vampire, so he decided to make the rebels think a vampire was attacking them. He ordered a squad to capture several communist rebels, then their necks were punctured and the blood removed. The bodies were then left for the locals to find. Edward's strange plan did not help eliminate armed resistance. What he failed to understand was that the Aswang normally attacked pregnant women. They weren't vampires at all. Before Cher became famous, she had to overcome an unexpected obstacle. In 1962, at the age of 16 years old, Cher dropped out of school and moved to Los Angeles. She met Sonny Bono, and he introduced her to Phil Spector, the famous record producer. Cher recorded a song called Ringo I Love You, which was about Ringo Starr from the Beatles. She performed the song under the name Bunny Joe Mason, but she couldn't get any radio stations to play the single. Because of her deep voice, the radio station managers thought a man was singing. More specifically, they thought Cher was homosexual and didn't want to play the single. After this, Cher began performing with Sonny. They first hit the Billboard Top 100 in 1965 with a cover of Bob Dylan's All I Really Want to Do. Sometimes large birds can kill. The southern cassowary is a large flightless bird native to Australia and surrounding areas. They can jump very high and have extremely sharp claws, and they are also known for being very aggressive. The first reported death by cassowary happened on April 6, 1926 in Australia. 
A 16-year-old boy and his younger brother came upon a cassowary on their property. The older boy decided to kill it with a club. The bird attacked, severing the teenager's jugular vein. Only one other death by cassowary has been recorded. A 75-year-old man in Florida kept one as a pet for years. But on April 12, 2019, the elderly man fell to the ground. His pet cassowary then clawed him to death. Everybody dies eventually, but for one magician, his fans refused to believe it was true. Benjamin Rucker was born in Amherst, Virginia on June 6, 1889. He learned to perform magic and adopted the strange name Black Herman. Black Herman's most famous illusion was called Buried Alive. As the audience watched, he was placed in a coffin and buried beneath the ground. Then three days later, a crew would dig up his coffin. Herman would then travel to the stage and complete his show. Black Herman and his crew traveled all over the country. On April 15, 1944, they were staying at a hotel in Louisville, Kentucky. Herman suddenly had a heart attack and died. The magician's fans refused to believe it was true. Black Herman's body was put on display and tickets were sold to those who wanted to view it. What do you think the largest oil spill was? The answer might surprise you. In 1909, the Lakeview Oil Company began drilling for oil in Kern County, California. It soon became clear that they were accessing the largest oil reserves in the United States. Today, it is known that when drilling very deep, the pressure increases. Modern wells have equipment to prevent blowouts, but this didn't exist when Lakeview Oil Company began drilling. On March 15, 1910, oil began rising from the hole in the ground. It gushed into the sky and fell on the ground below. It emerged at a rate of almost 19,000 barrels a day. It took until September 1911 to stop the leak. In that time, over 9 million barrels of oil poured out of the well. Only 40% of it was captured. The Lakeview Gusher is still the largest oil spill in history. Cable television has produced some strange programs. The Turner Broadcasting System, or TBS, was a television channel created in 1976. It was known for showing sports, movies, and syndicated sitcoms. In 1999, TBS decided to create its own show. The result was a sitcom called The Chimp Channel. It was a, about a fictional cable network run by chimpanzees. It also featured the shows produced by the primates. Voices were provided by human actors. Tom Stern was the creator of the series, but during production he protested the network's decisions by making an improv comedy scene with nudity and liquor bottles. He was fired. The first episode of the new series aired on June 10, 1999. Critics hated the show, claiming that it stopped being funny after about five minutes. The Chimp Channel released its 13th and final episode on December 16th. Serial killers have been with us for a long time. Today, Germany is a relatively safe place, but in the 1500s, the area around Nuremberg was full of criminals. Bandits roamed the countryside, stealing and killing at every opportunity. Peter Niers was the most brutal among them. In 1566, at the age of 26, he began his career as a murderer and a thief. He was so successful that his name became known for miles around. One day in 1581, as he was lounging at a bathhouse, the locals looked through his belongings and found body parts. Peter was arrested and put on trial. He was sentenced to death. Peter was tortured to death over the course of three days. He confessed to 544 murders before finally being killed. But he didn't die quickly. After being smashed with a giant wheel 42 times, Peter was still alive. The executioner had to dismember him to finish the job. During World War II, there was a famous cat that couldn't be killed. Oscar was probably born in Germany in 1940. His first owner was a seaman on the German battleship the Bismarck. The British destroyer, HMS Cossack, sank the Bismarck on May 18, 1941. The British sailors found Oscar floating in the water and brought him on board. He served as the ship's cat until October 24, when his new ship was hit by a torpedo. After being rescued again, Oscar was transferred to the aircraft carrier HMS Ark Royal. He was also given the nickname Unsinkable Sam. But on November 14th, that ship was also sunk by a torpedo. After being pulled from the water yet again, Oscar was sent to live in Belfast, Ireland. He passed away in 1955. 
Sometimes when you ask for help, you still die, but someone else might get lucky. On the afternoon of July 24, 1989, two men from Tokyo were climbing Mount Asahidake. They got lost and couldn't return from their trip. Hokkaido police jumped in a helicopter and began looking for the missing hikers. They saw an SOS message created by downed trees. A little north of the sign, the hikers were found. The rescuers soon discovered that the missing hikers were not the ones who created the distress signal. Apparently, someone else needed help, too. After searching the area on foot, the skeleton of a hiker was discovered. His belongings were in a hole not far away. The man had gone missing in 1984. Among the items left behind was a cassette tape, which recorded him yelling for help. Environmental activists have done many strange things to save the planet. That includes living in a tree. Julia Butterfly Hill was born in Mount Vernon, Missouri in 1974. In July 1996, she was rear-ended by a drunk driver. The steering wheel was driven into Julia's head, but she recovered and the following year embarked on a mission. She wanted to stop loggers from cutting redwood trees. In December 1997, she climbed a giant redwood named Luna that was located near Stratford, California. Julia remained there for 738 days, enduring freezing rain, wind, insects, as well as harassment from helicopters. She kept warm with a sleeping bag and lived from supplies brought by supporters. In 1999, the lumber company finally agreed to spare Luna and the trees around it. Julia then left her redwood home. But in 2000, someone tried to cut Luna down. The tree survived, but it now has a 19-foot-long gash across its base. One English writer made the ultimate sacrifice for her art. Edith Allenby was born in Cark, England on December 1st, 1875. She became a teacher and eventually a writer. Edith published her first novel, Jewel Sowers, in 1903. Then in 1905, she published Marigold. The books didn't sell very well. When Edith wanted to publish her third novel, The Fulfillment, she became frustrated. Editors insisted on changes, but Edith thought that her latest book was the result of divine inspiration. She developed a plan to help her new book sell. On September 5th, Edith drank a bottle of carbolic acid. She was found dead in her chair soon thereafter. But her plan worked. The fulfillment was finally published. Did you know that Europeans used to use cannons to tell time? Before the invention of modern clocks, it was difficult to know what time it was. In the 1600s, lunch was just as important to people then as it is now. For those that needed to know when noon arrived, the sundial cannon was a useful tool. A lens would focus the ray of the sun on a single point. When the sun was bright enough, the concentrated light would ignite a fuse, then the cannon would fire. In 1979, a company named Dixie Gunworks sold miniature kits that could be assembled to create one of these strange timekeeping devices. Today, the only sundial cannon that fires regularly is located in Sweden. Women in the past were willing to do anything to lose weight. The Victorian era was full of strange beauty standards. Women would wear tight corsets and try to make themselves look as pale as possible. Another prized attribute was being extremely thin. For those who found it difficult to lose weight, there was a cure. It was called the tapeworm diet. A woman could take a pill which would infect her with the parasite. Then she could eat all the food she wanted and still lose weight. Unfortunately, doctors didn't necessarily know how to get rid of the tapeworms. Today, historians aren't sure if the tapeworm pills really infected the women with a parasite or if it was a placebo. There is no doubt, however, that thousands of women were willing to infect themselves in the name of beauty. For one man, staying hydrated is a difficult task. Mark Vuenhorst is an architect from Germany. He was born with a condition called diabetes insipidus. It causes his kidneys to excrete water extremely quickly. If Mark goes more than an hour without drinking water, he could dehydrate and die. He has to consume at least 50 liters a day to stay healthy. Thanks to the massive amount of water Mark drinks, he says that he's never slept more than two hours consecutively. The reason why is he has to visit the bathroom up to 50 times a day. And if he sleeps too long without drinking, Mark will dehydrate and die. For one man, winning a fist fight cost him his life. In April 1873, Edward Stanton McCook was sent to South Dakota. He was there to replace the corrupt governor of the territory, John Burbank. 
On September 11th, Edwin was at a public meeting at a nearby hotel. A banker became angry and challenged Edwin to a fight. Edwin was huge and the banker was small, so he defeated the man easily. A few minutes later, the small banker produced a revolver and shot Edwin four times. Edwin tried to beat the man again, but had to be restrained. The next day, Edwin Stanton McCook, who had served under Ulysses S. Grant during the Civil War, was dead from blood loss. The banker who shot him was put on trial, then acquitted. A lot of people hate their jobs, but for one man, he could only see one way out. Joon Tae-il was born in South Korea in 1948. His family was very poor. Joon wanted to go to school, but instead he had to work to help his family. Joon moved to Seoul and became a tailor. He noticed that working conditions in the city were horrible. Tuberculosis was spreading through the sweatshops, and some people were injected with drugs to keep them awake so they could work more hours. Joan created a labor movement to raise awareness. The government told him to stop. Instead, Joan decided there was only one way to bring attention to the cause. He set himself on fire and ran through the streets of Seoul, yelling that workers were human too. Joan didn't survive, but labor unions were created as a result of his sacrifice. A lot of bombs were dropped during World War II. One mission eliminated an entire community. Heligoland is a small group of islands in the North Sea. During World War II, the islands were used to store German airplanes, and the ports helped repair submarines too. The British Royal Air Force attacked the islands in 1939, and the Royal Navy tried to take them in 1940. Both attempts failed. Germany kept its grip on the island until April 1945, when over 1,000 Allied aircraft dropped 7,000 bombs on Heligoland. When the bombing stopped, the island was rendered uninhabitable. The locals who survived were evacuated. They weren't allowed to return home until 1952. Throughout history, there have been a few people that just couldn't be killed. Wenceslao Mogel was born in Merida, Mexico on November 1, 1896. When the Mexican Revolution began in 1910, he fought under Pancho Villa. Unfortunately, Mogel was still fighting with Pancho Villa when he tried to overthrow the Mexican government. On March 18, 1915, Mogel was captured by the Mexican army. He was placed in front of a firing squad and eight bullets were shot into his body. Then another bullet was put in his head just to make sure the job was done. But Wenceslao Mogel wasn't dead. He crawled away and found help. He died in 1976 at the age of 79. One woman found a justice for her daughter after being visited by a ghost. Zona Heaster was born in West Virginia in 1873. In 1896, she met a man who moved to town named Erasmus Shue. The two were soon married. On January 23, 1897, Zona's body was found at the bottom of her stairs. Her death was ruled an accident and Zona was buried in the nearby cemetery. Zona's mother prayed until the ghost of her daughter appeared. The apparition said that Erasmus had murdered her. She went to the local prosecutor who agreed to reopen the case. Zona's body was exhumed and the medical examiner found she had been strangled. Erasmus was convicted and sent to prison where he died from an illness in 1900. To ward off evil spirits, some places in Hong Kong have a bun climbing festival. In the 1700s, the islands were visited by pirates and plague. To save themselves, the residents sacrificed to their gods. This simple act of survival started a new tradition. Now every year, from mid-April to mid-May, the residents of Hong Kong have a festival to celebrate the ritual. As part of the festivities, they have a bun climbing festival. Giant towers are covered in buns. Then men and women compete with each other by climbing the towers and gathering as much bread as possible. Most of the time it is a safe activity, but in the past, bun climbing has hurt people. The last time was in 1978, when a tower collapsed and injured over 1,000 spectators. Criminals will do some surprising things to avoid prison. In 2015, police in Tampa, Florida started looking for Kirk Kelly. He was wanted for violating his probation. Kirk was on probation for selling drugs and guns. Six months later, police in Akron, Ohio pulled over a car. Kirk was the passenger and kept lying about his identity. When he overheard police talk about bringing a portable fingerprint scanner, 
Kirk Kelly reacted by chewing his fingertips off. By erasing his fingerprints, Kirk thought he might avoid jail. Instead, he received an additional charge of tampering with evidence. Kirk Kelly won't be getting out anytime soon. Florida police discovered the guns he sold connected to as many as 15 murders. Winning horse races is serious business, and for one man, even death couldn't stop him. On June 4, 1923, Frank Hayes was a 22-year-old who lived in Elmont, New York. He helped train horses and also worked with them in the stables. But on this day, he was finally given a chance to try his skills as a rider. Frank was the jockey for a horse named Sweet Kiss. She won the race, and at the finish line, officials rushed to congratulate Frank. That's when they found he was dead. As the horse was racing around the track, Frank had a heart attack. This made Frank the first and only known jockey to win a race after dying. The horse he rode never raced again. People began calling her Sweet Kiss of Death. During World War I, a war hero was almost executed by mistake. Albert Severin Rocher fought for France during the war. One day, Albert was the only survivor in his unit. He was captured, but he killed his interrogator and returned to the front line. In 1917, Albert's captain was seriously wounded. Albert crawled for hours to reach him, then spent hours dragging him back to safety. The captain was alive but in a coma. After this heroic feat, Albert was exhausted and fell asleep. The soldiers who found him thought he had fallen asleep on duty. They were going to execute him for his crime. The captain came out of his coma and sent a message right before the firing squad ended Albert's life. During the war, Albert was wounded nine times and took over 1,000 prisoners. In the 1800s, one man thought that crashing two trains together was a great idea. In the 1880s, a Missouri-Kansas-Texan railroad began upgrading its trains. William Crush, a passenger agent, had an idea. If the old trains were destroyed in a head-on collision, spectators would pay to see it. On September 15, 1896, over 40,000 people gathered at a site between Dallas and Houston that was named Crush. At around 5 p.m., the two trains began rushing at each other, traveling about 45 miles per hour. When they collided, the explosion sent debris flying. Two spectators were killed and six more were injured. A reporter covering the event also lost an eye when a bolt flew into it. The railroad had to pay thousands of dollars in settlements, but the international attention it received helped increase ticket sales. Railroads continued staging collisions to entertain the public until 1935. In the 1960s, one town tried to improve its local economy by using nuclear weapons. Project Plowshare was created in 1957 as part of the Atoms for Peace effort. The idea was that nuclear weapons weren't just a tool of war, they could also be used for peaceful purposes. On September 10, 1969, a nuclear bomb was placed underground a few miles south of Rulison, Colorado. When the explosion was triggered, it was supposed to make it easier to access natural gas deposits. It did make the gas deposits accessible, unfortunately they were also contaminated with radiation. The natural gas couldn't be extracted or sold. The local economy didn't benefit from the experiment. Also, the federal government had to clean the blast site, a task that wasn't completed until 1998. Abraham Lincoln's assassin had a brother, and he also had an impact on the president's family. Edwin Booth was five years older than his brother John Wilkes Booth. Edwin was well known for performing in Shakespeare's plays. In early 1865, Abraham Lincoln's son Robert joined the army and was assigned to the staff of Ulysses Grant. One night, he was standing on a platform waiting to board the train. The train started moving and Robert fell between the train and the platform. Before the train could crush Robert, Edwin Booth grabbed him and pulled him back to safety. Edwin didn't realize who he had saved until months later when a member of General Grant's staff sent a thank you letter. <laughs> 